Now I'm going to roll right into uh, the next talk, uh, which is going to take a little bit of a step back into a few more basic aspects, with re which relates to uh, the acquisition of coronary CTA and some of the details. Here are my disclosures again. The challenge of imaging the coronary arteries with CT is they are not very big and they are always moving. Here is a direct injection of the right coronary artery and you can see just how much excursion occurs uh, over the course of the cardiac period, which uh, you know, when we're fortunate is uh, once a second uh, or slower, but frequently is faster than that. And I would ask you, which study would you rather read? You know, you got the CT uh, on the left, there's two images there. It's very noisy. Uh, the right coronary artery is, is pretty smudgy there uh, versus this highly magnified view of uh, a, a portion of a left anterior descending coronary artery, as it turns out, that has some complex plaque but is very clearly delineated. This is to the root of the issue of acquiring the data as best as possible uh, to get those kind of images. And, you know, we operate in a spectrum of environments. Some of us get to scan on the Ferrari. Others, <laughs> maybe your scanner's a few years old. And then, you know, there's sites where the driver of the Ferrari really knows how to operate that scanner. And other times, <laughs> maybe not so much. And sometimes, you know, the guy with the Ferrari doesn't, get, doesn't know what he's doing, and the guy who really knows what he's doing is stuck with the old clunker. Whatever it is, you know, you need to make the most of what you've got, and you need to uh, also hopefully be the guy who knows how to drive it and not uh, Homer here. Because not every road to a diagnostic coronary CTA looks like this. Many of them look like this. And uh, we want to uh, try to figure out how to navigate uh, those roads to get a diagnostic scan as often as possible. Really, really important. I just want to put this slide up here. The uh, Society of uh, Cardiac Computed Tomography has put forward uh, some performance standards for the acquisition of coronary CTA. You might have a look at this article, which has a lot of specifics that I won't have a chance to talk about. So determining CT image quality, uh, I really see six primary factors. The patient themselves is a huge influence. The way we design our CT acquisition is a big influence. The way we design our contrast administration, the provider system we're in. Sometimes we can have the most ideal patient, the best scanner, the best physician, and it's all the stuff that happens in between, communication uh, with um, technologists, between nursing, scheduling, all kinds of things, and we uh, sometimes can defeat ourselves just with the system. So we need to keep that in mind. And then finally, the reconstruction of the data. Um, I'm only really gonna be focusing on CT acquisition and maybe a little bit about the patient as well. So let's talk about patient factors really quickly here. There are a number of factors that influence uh, the quality of the CTA and the strategies that we're going to take um, when we're imaging patients. Uh, most notably, the size of the patient, as we've seen uh, over and over during this conference, has a tremendous influence on the image properties, uh, but heart rate and rhythm are critical as well. Uh, I put height here. Uh, if you think about the height or the length of the heart, how, how much coverage is needed does have an influence from some of these uh, protocols as well. And age, bear in mind, uh, can have an influence on how sensitive uh, radiation exposure is going to be for the patient's health. And then, of course, amongst the most important is the ability to follow instructions because patients do need to follow instructions. So I, I uh, took uh, some liberty from an article that was published in the British Journal of Radiology uh, a couple of years ago and uh, rearranged and, and redefined a few of these categories, but I liked uh, the rubric in general. Uh, these are some of the imaging challenges that we face uh, based upon the patients that present themselves to us. They're particularly challenging. People with high calcium burden, people who come with stents, people with a high heart rate, irregular heart rate, non-compliant patients, big patients. And if we ask the question of what are the scan goals that we might look to to address these, high spatial resolution uh, would help with stents and calcium burden. High temporal resolution is what we're going to need for this group of patients. Um, a uh, high degree of coverage per rotation. Uh, and. Uh, high x-ray tube output. These are key properties of our scanning systems and the acquisitions that we're going to create, uh, and you can see the alignment in addressing some of these, and I'd like to take them one at a time. So with respect to spatial resolution, 
Uh, what we know is that the detector size and composition, as well as the detector width, reconstruction type, and kernel makes a difference. Here you can see some images uh, from France uh, showing two different systems. Um, one, a high resolution system, uh, and the other a conventional system where we see greater clarity of the stent uh, and the instant stenosis, the neoinimal hyperplasia. And here is the reference standard of angiography. Uh, here are some images that uh, Dr. Katada from uh, Fujita uh, University in Japan, um, working with the system that we saw demonstrated from Canon earlier this week. Uh, you can see with their system the similar benefit uh, with respect to conventional versus this high resolution method and seeing greater detail the stent and the instant stenosis. Another example, higher detector um, resolution and uh, comp uh, more favorable composition shows greater clarity, in this case on uh, normal plaque. Uh, and you can see it blown up here, the clarity of the calcium, less blooming of the calcium, uh, as you see here in these uh, same patient, uh, two different scanners. And here also um, from Dr. Katada, uh, you can see the striking difference in terms of the clarity uh, of the calcification and more importantly, the clarity with which the lumen is seen adjacent to it. So in the setting of high calcium burden and stents, a high resolution system surely would be nice and we would choose that. Let's move on to the next one, and that is where temporal resolution makes a big difference. These are people who have high rate heart rates, and um, we never accept a high heart rate without doing our best pharmacologically to reduce it. And we'll have a talk about the use of uh, beta blockers uh, to do that. Very, very important. Irregular heart rates, patients with atrial fibrillation can be a challenge. Non-compliant patients uh, as well, if they're moving a little bit, the higher the temporal resolution, the better chance we have of freezing that motion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just to define temporal resolution is the time required in order to create a transverse reconstruction, to collect the data for uh, a transverse section. Uh, uh, the temporal resolution can be applied uh, to scans that require a single heartbeat or scans that require multiple heartbeats. The gantry rotation time is the primary determinant, uh, but multi-source scanners also have a major influence, as we'll see in a moment. And it's also worth recognizing that motion can also be mitigated post-scan with dedicated correction algorithms. So here's an example of a patient with a higher heart rate. Here's a patient with a lower heart rate. And you can see with a lower heart rate, whatever the, this fixed temporal resolution in this particular case, um, we can see uh, the anomalous origin of the left main coronary artery here uh, at 65 beats per minute, but at 82 is just a big smudge. This is an example of the use of post-processing uh, algorithm to correct motion. Uh, you can see that the two images on the right, which are of the right coronary artery, uh, demonstrate blurring of the vessel, and uh, the uh, motion correction brings them uh, into higher fidelity in a patient with a higher heart rate. Uh, but getting back to the temporal resolution issue, the way to think about uh, this uh, aspect of our scanners is, is that it takes 180 degrees of information in order to reconstruct a transverse section. And so if we have a scanner that rotates in approximately 300 milliseconds, you know, we have 280 millisecond, 270 millisecond scanners, uh, but the approximately 300, it's going to be 150 milliseconds of data, 150 millisecond temporal resolution on this scanner to reconstruct uh, a single transverse section. That would be our temporal resolution. That's how long it takes. It's pretty quick. Now, dual source scanners uh, have the benefit of, because there's two x-ray tubes only needing to rotate 90 degrees. And so if we have a scanner that rotates a full 360 degree rotation every 300 milliseconds, then one quarter of a turn takes only 75 milliseconds. And so a 75 millisecond versus a 150 millisecond temporal resolution is a substantial difference in the interest of freezing motion. Happens very, very quickly. So that's the uh, fundamental temporal resolution, but ultimately the question then is, is how do we scan the patient? How do we get through the scans? So let's talk through some of these scanning modes quickly. Prospective triggering, uh, which is typically going to be applied with uh, what we currently consider smaller width detectors, four to six centimeter detectors, um, where basically um, we acquire uh, a scan uh, in this particular case modeled in diastole that covers uh, a quarter of the heart and then the table translates during the next beat and then another scan 
table translates, another scan, another scan. So you notice that I'm kind of mixing the z-axis here, the table travel motion uh, along the ECG tracing here. And so it's these four heartbeats that sum up uh, to result in uh, the, the CT scan. Now, uh, that was an example here of 175 millisecond temporal resolution. And if we're scanning um, with the dual source scanner, for example, at 66 millimeter, uh, sorry, 66 millisecond temporal resolution, then here you can see how that aligns. Each scan takes less time. The total scan duration is the same. Um, one fundamental... Uh, property of perspective triggering that we can use on any scanner is this principle of padding, where we can uh, rotate uh, the gantry and collect data a little bit more than 180 or 90 degrees, and then reconstruct uh, a little temporal window around that point. And it's uh, at the expense of a little greater radiation exposure, but a little more flexibility in terms of when we reconstruct. Now compare that to retrospective gating, where retrospective gating is when we have a continuous helical acquisition uh, that uh, is typically with a relatively low pitch factor, probably about 0.2 in most cases. Here you can see that is modeled by this blue line as we go from uh, the Z position of zero through the heart. Um, it offers maximum flexibility, displaying dynamic information, um, but without any modulation of the x-ray source can result in a very high radiation exposure to the patient. Um, in this particular case, I'm changing our uh, y-axis to the tube output instead of z, just to show you what I mean by uh, tube pulsing here. So usually the tube is full on in end diastole and then goes low uh, in systole and back on uh, full on, and that helps to reduce the overall radiation exposure to the patient. Here's an example of a uh, ECG during a CT scan uh, that shows uh, the acquisition. You can see the line of the ECG tracing at the end on the on your right, uh, and uh, when the line is thicker, that's when the x-ray tube is on at full strength. And here's an example of a retrospectively gated scan, a very uh, nice quality in this particular case, well-registered, a uh, favorable result. The other benefits with retrospective gating is, is that we can get um, dynamic information here, in this case, of a uh, stenotic aortic valve. You can see the noise coming in systole and then uh, mitigating in diastole. Okay, so that's temporal resolution. Let's focus then on the coverage per rotation. Uh, in particular, if a patient has an irregular heart rhythm and we're trying to build up the heart image over multiple heartbeats, there's an opportunity for substantial misregistration. Also, if patients are struggling to hold their breath, struggling to hold still, extending over multiple heartbeats can be a problem too. And so um, what we're going to um, have to recognize is, is that with retrospective gating, this is about a seven second period of time for the patient to move and have these multiple heartbeats. And with prospective triggering, even with a 66 millisecond temporal resolution, it is a six second window approximately for the scan. Uh, here is an example of a prospectively triggered scan in a patient with a very favorable heart rate, 53 beats per minute. It looks great, uh, and here is the scan. And you can see that there, on the volume rendering, that there is substantial misregistration uh, in the upper uh, and lower third of the heart across the LAD and the left circumflex uh, coronary arteries. And if you look at the interface, you can see how much motion is occurring at those interfaces. This is an example of a patient who just couldn't hold still during the scan, and even though everything seems to be favorable, the fact that it took six seconds was just too long for this particular patient, and that results in uh, this uh, misregistration that um, hopefully you can see at those three levels, which is the interface of each of the scans. Here's another patient where I just want to draw your attention to the right coronary artery, where it looks like there's a blind ending branch, uh, and that that branch might be an occluded branch. But if you look critically at it, uh, you'll see it, it looks a little bit funny on this curve reformation. We see two uh, apparent right coronary arteries right at the site of that branching point on the transverse section. Um, but uh, here uh, is a lung window, which is a great way to see the motion, and you can see how much misregistration there is. This is just an example of patient motion occurring uh, at the interface on a prospectively triggered scan. 
Now, the alternative uh, to get high degree of longitudinal coverage is to have a wide area detector, as is modeled on the right. Uh, and the idea is, is with a wide area detector, you can acquire your scan in a single beat. And that has a huge benefit, because the scan duration then, uh, in this 140 millisecond temporal resolution uh, example, is 140 milliseconds. And that can be very effective. Here's a patient with chronic atrial fibrillation uh, that was scanned a few years ago on a 320 row scanner. And even though there is uh, irregularly irregular heart rate, you see a very uh, excellent clarity, and you can use these scanners uh, to acquire a Cine acquisition. It's all just one heartbeat playing over and over again. Um, we can get single heartbeat imaging with smaller detector scanners by using a high pitch method. Uh, and this is specifically with the dual source. Uh, the pitch used here is 3.2. In this particular case, the scan duration is 220 milliseconds with a 66 millisecond temporal resolution. That's covering 16 centimeters of the patient um, with the scan duration derived, as you see down below. And this can be a very effective method. Here you see a high pitch dual source single beat scan uh, on your uh, right. And uh, excellent uh, demonstration here of the left anterior descending coronary artery. Finally, uh, for large patients, having high x-ray tube output is important. Uh, this is just a little bit of an analogy between photography. If you're uh, not as in tune to a number of the different characteristics of the CT scanner and the effect that they have on the images, uh, in particular, uh, the tube current is essentially like your aperture on your camera, letting more light in uh, and uh, mitigating the effects of noise in particular. Currently, the um, maximum uh, generator, uh, x-ray generator power is between 100 and 120 kilowatts on most systems. Remembering that the dual source scanners have two tubes that provide 120 kilowatts, older scanners will have less power on their tubes. And it's important to be aware of how much power you have in order to mitigate the effects of noise. Here's a 46-year-old, 398-pound patient uh, who presented with a history of ventricular tachycardia. She's throwing some uh, uh, PVCs. And here you can see the prospectively triggered scan uh, that we're performing there on the right. Uh, and uh, by really uh, bumping up the MA to a very high level here on this uh, scanner, 1,630 MA, MAS of 412 with a 250 millisecond rotation, you can see that we get decent image quality and we get diagnostic results. It's not beautiful, but this is the kind of thing that you need to plan for and be prepared for when you have some of your uh, particularly uh, larger patients. So this is just a quick summary slide of the different modes of acquisition. Um, I'll just sort of put it up there. It's in the syllabus. It can be reviewed online. I won't talk through it. Um, just to remind you that I've only touched upon really CT acquisition and patient factors. Contrast delivery is critical. Having a good system in place is critical. And there's a lot to talk about with re respect to reconstruction, particularly the use of iterative reconstruction. But let me summarize this talk by saying that patients often present with anatomic and physiologic conditions that challenge CT image quality. Uh, and we have to be prepared to respond to them. We need to understand how we can use our scanners most effectively, tailor our acquisitions to meet those demands, and hopefully have CT scanners that allow us that degree of flexibility. And with that, I thank you again for your attention.